Hi, my name is Amy Hannum, and I am an artist in New London, Connecticut. I have a large exhibit at Connecticut College right now, and I decided with my new YouTube channel, why not give people uh, an, an idea of what my exhibits are like? And this one is quite all-encompassing. I have uh, several different series at play here. So this is my attempt at a first video, and uh, I can't flip the camera around while, while I'm videotaping, so I'm going to see if I can do this all in one take, and uh, we will see what happens. So here is Connecticut College. The Charles E. Shane Library. And here is the poster for my show. Otherly Lingual is a study in nonverbal communication. It's experienced through the visual arts. And uh, I will talk about the different series at play in this exhibit um, as we take a look at them. So here we go. Might be a little quieter here because it is the day before Thanksgiving. So hopefully that will help us out. So when you first enter the library, you have a large case here with the work called Dark Matter. And this is an installation that is descriptive of the feelings that I get when I practice Reiki. Uh, a little bit hard to see with all the light bouncing off of it. But you essentially have a star field between two hands. And you can see the movement or the force of the energy transferring from one hand to the other. Uh, the case is about 12 feet long by 8 feet high. In the center here we have the Migration Series. And the Migration Series focuses on instances in time to which most people can relate. Uh, for example, let's see, this is nesting. I should have brought something to block all these lights with. Um, somebody said a big piece of cardboard is helpful. So nesting, oh here we go. Nesting is a meditation on those times when we find people that we can relate to, we feel close to them, there's an intimacy, and everybody knows what that is like. Everybody has experienced that at one point in their lives, or at least I hope they have. So the Migration Series captures these emotional moments that tie us to other human beings through emotional states. This is nesting. This is chess. The idea that life is a game. You can see the chess board in encaustic on the piece. These little figures moving through the squares. much better experienced in person. This piece is called Protection. I made this piece in response to the epi epidemic that is happening with the, um, the bee colonies, the colony uh, collapse that we're experiencing. So this piece here explores the idea of protection, protecting our world, protecting our resources, protecting endangered species. This piece here, oops, I'm going to get it from the other angle. This is the very first piece in the migration series. Uh, this is where it all began. I wonder if it will focus in on that. So this is the very, very first piece in the series, which came about in 2010. 
This is where the concept for sculpting the fabric and, uh, and caustic together. Once again, these lights are killing me. Um, this piece here is called Caverns. This was an, a really interesting piece working with the dimension that you can get from wax. The height, the real sculptural possibilities uh, with the addition of shells found on the beach. And this Caverns is about exploring our territory. This piece is age old. Uh, and this piece is a meditation on our very beginnings. Uh, thinking about Fibonacci cycle, thinking about fractalization, thinking about evolution, early forms. And you can see the pieces actually moving right off the canvas. Moving over to the next case, we have a crowd favorite, within and without. Um, these pieces have won a couple different awards, um, local awards. Uh, the Connecticut Academy of Fine Arts um, really like this piece. And it was also given, I'm trying to think of who else, oh, I should know this. But anyway, we were talking about, this is what it is the world feels like when people work together. There's a cohesiveness, there's a pattern, there's a comfort. And then we have what things look like when we are not working together. It's a little chaotic, a little bit like rats abandoning a sinking ship. Ooh, once again, you can see the texture of these pieces. They can be wall-mounted or they can be displayed on a pedestal or in a vitrine like this. Now we are on to fences. Here we have our character, this little figure, seemingly trapped, yet free to escape at any moment, yet feeling completely enclosed and trapped in its environment. <clears throat> in this last case, we have one of my favorite pieces, Defiance. I like this piece hanging on the wall better than laying down, but you still get this idea of defying gravity these pools of water that remain absolutely still in the color and just am in love with this color. So behind the thoughts behind this piece is that all those times when people told you you couldn't do something but you knew that you could and going ahead and doing it anyway and ignoring all the people who tell you you can't do something. And this is, I believe, the last piece in the Migration series. And this is called Alpha. And Alpha came about after a meditation on the birth of our universe. I was thinking of a star nursery. Let me see if I can get right in here. And you can see the shapes inside. So this is my little star nursery the beginning of everything, even before age old. And that takes care of this first section of the migration series in the beautifully renovated Charles E. Shane Library. 
And now we'll go upstairs and check out the other cases. I hope you don't get dizzy on our little walk. This is going to be a fun experiment. Figuring out YouTube has been interesting already. <laughs> um, next we're going to go into the special collections office. And we'll say hi to everybody there. Or maybe I'll grab some footage of the spiderweb pieces first. So this is another one of my large series. The migration series is a large series of work. Um, the spiderweb series is another large series of work. This is one of the early spiderweb pieces. Uh, this one was inspired by Richard Brodigan's book In Watermelon Sugar. Um, this one has about five different spiderwebs on it. And then pigmented in between with paint and just raw pigment. Uh, the Spiderweb series began in 2006. This is called Space. I really love the way that this web turned out. I'm sorry about the lights once again. Um, oh yeah, that helps a little bit, but then of course everything's dark. <laughs> this is called Isa. And Isa is a Nordic rune, which means stand still, uh, to be frozen or to stagnate. And since these pieces are frozen in time, I thought that was very appropriate. Um, a lot of times I like to name webs for friends or people that I'm thinking about. Uh, it's hard to see the web in this one. But this is called Jason's Web, because these are Jason's favorite colors. And I was just, this is a more masculine web than, than some of the others. Yeah, very hard to see the web in here. Let's see if maybe this is a little bit better. You can see it a little bit. This one is Dorothy's web. It's my artist friend, Dorothy Hall loves the colors orange and green. So when I made this web, I was thinking of her. And these are real spider webs. These are, uh, it's a complicated process of painting the web and painting the background, and then the two are combined. This is Sky Sailing, which is encaustic and a spider web. That's another favorite. A uh, poet wrote, wrote a poem about it called Isadora's in the Pink, and it was about an acrobat in a circus um, who was very spider-like. That was, that was wonderful. So that was right in a gallery where this was showing um, and written for this piece. This is The Joyful Shout, and uh, that was inspired by a book on uh, Chinese astrology that I was reading that talks about the body and how the body uh, regenerates in the spring and how certain foods are good to eat in the spring and kind of what is going on with the body according to Chinese medicine in the springtime. And it was a lot about eating. And so you can see this little brown spot down there that is a little meal for the spider. And so this reminded me very much of that book that I had read couple different spiderweb pieces inspired by books. This one, hopefully you can see this, this is graphite web. So these webs were made by, oh here we go, yeah, I can focus, awesome. Um, this is five different spider webs that I simply sanded uh, charcoal onto. And um, I guess it's charcoal web, not graphite web. I may have said graphite. Um, but this is a very elegant piece, letting the beauty of the grain of the wood show through with the uh, natural vine charcoal coating the web. It turned out really nicely. And here's another favorite, kind of reminds me of Superman. Um, this is Anywhere and Everywhere. Um, I very, very quickly had to paint this background and I was just thinking about the interconnection interconnectedness of the world. Um, and this piece came out 
really well, considering how quickly I had to paint the background. It was all finger painted in pigment and then sealed in acrylic spray. And then a nice red web right on top. And by the way, where the center of the web is, that is completely unplanned. It's however the web lands on the panel or the canvas. So that was not planned, although this area might be a little bit of a hot spot. All right, so let's go into the Linda Lear Center for Special Collections and see Ben Pansiera, who put this exhibit together for me. Hi there, how are you? Hey, how are you? I'm going to be doing a little video if nobody minds. <laughs> so this is a larger spider web work. This is about two feet by two feet um, using very large spider webs. Uh, I was lucky enough to find a friend who had really large spider webs on their porch and captured um, this, you know, really, really good size. It's uh, wood spiders that make these nice big webs. This is a, this was a different spider. But these larger webs were made by wood spiders. And they're really fun creatures to work with. Um, they don't always like to leave their webs, so then I can't get them. <laughs> Uh, this piece here is called Reconciliation. I was inspired by the work of Martin Klein that I saw at the New Britain Museum, or the uh, New Britain Museum of Art. And uh, he uses this technique called accretion, which is the layering of wax in, in a semi-cool state so that it builds up um, like a stalagmite. i try and see if you can see that texture there. Um, and this was a really nice big orb uh, wood spider as well. I only collect the orb weaver webs. Uh, I do not go after cobwebs, which when I'm looking for spider webs, a lot of people say, oh, I've got a ton in my basement. Well, those are cobwebs. And maybe I'll start working with them, but they're not as interesting to me as the, uh, the orb weaver webs, which have such a great pattern. Um, this is one of my first spider web pieces. So this piece is from 2006. Some people just like the plaster. This is tinted plaster. That's the background. Um, I love flying and just the, the view of the sky at sunrise or sunset from a plane is something that is incredibly beautiful to me. Uh, very inspirational and moving. And so I captured that and then put a silver spider web on top of it, like a silver lining in a cloud. Let's see if we can get a nice close up of that. And the spiders that make the webs, you can tell how big a spider is because the size of the spider directly relates to the spacing in between the webs. Uh, so the size of their legs and the size of their body will dictate the spacing between the lines in the web, which I always think is really fascinating. Um, move over to another one of my favorite pieces. This is memory container, or sometimes just called memory. It is a large, about 36 inches in diameter, maple stump that was given to me by my friends. It came from Westerly, Rhode Island. I brought it into the studio, stripped all the bark off of it. It's incredibly, incredibly smooth. It has a great, great texture. I encourage people to touch it. Please touch gently. Uh, people really do enjoy the texture of this piece. And then on top, I've imprinted it with the story of my life. Let's see if we can get these words to show up a little bit better. Yeah, there you go. So what I have done with this piece, I've worked around this lovely hen of the woods fungus that has grown on top of it. Let's focus again. Uh, so the very first ring in the tree, let me see if I can find this, is in here. Oh, there it is. If you can see that, you can see the H and the U 
house. Uh, when I was about six months old, my parents moved to a new house, but I have memories of our old house, which means that my first memory was somewhere between zero and six months old. I would describe my parents' first house to them, and they said, you know, how do you know that? Because no pictures existed. But yet I would describe in detail how the house was set up and where my crib was. I was in the living room. And they're like, you're making this up. How do you know this? And I'm just telling them that this is my earliest memory. So what I did was I wrote down my earliest memory and put it in the first ring of the tree. And then moving out through all of the rings in the tree are my other memories throughout the years of my life up until I think 34. I think there's 34 rings in the tree, having my own space. Very important. So you can come in and you can read the story of my life. Uh, the, the, the darker inked memories are the ones that stood out more, and then there are, there are stamped in letters that I have not inked that are the more faded memories. And some memories wouldn't fit within the lines at all. So it really was an exercise in memory and also how the brain works, how we forget things, how we remember things differently. Uh, very powerful piece. I encourage you to come and touch it sometime. Um, this was a very fun piece. This is my reaction to the age-old question, what is art? Um, and one of the artists that I look up to very much is David Lynch, um, not only for his filmmaking, but only also for uh, his furniture making and uh, his set design and set production. Um, he takes a very Bauhausian approach to his films and gets involved in every aspect, uh, you know, filming in his own houses, making his own furniture, and that's an aspect that I really admire as an artist is taking every part of the project in yourself and, and really having hand in the work. Um, this piece is called Dive Deep because David Lynch and I are both heavy meditators. Um, there was a great article in the New York Times Style Magazine written about him by Holly Brubeck called A Moving Canvas. So I made buttons for this piece and I wrote down all the words that I think that art is, desire, association, insight, light, technique, memory. So this is full of all of the words that I think art is and includes a little quote from Holly Brubeck's article. And of course, gives her credit, Holly Brubeck. Um, so this is a, a, an interactive piece. You can come and you can move the, the different pins around. Um, if you set it up correctly like a puzzle, you get David Lynch's face, and you get a couple excerpts from the article. Uh, and uh, thank God not too many people have seen Blue Velvet, and nobody has stolen his ear yet. So still got the ear. Yay. Um, Above that is a piece that's going to be kind of hard to see. This is a piece called Current Events that was made in response to technology uh, based on, you know, the three monkeys that you see, you know, speak no evil, see no evil, hear no evil. But here these people are not speaking. They're only talking to each other through computers. And here these people are not seeing they're not aware of what's going on around them because they're on their phones. Uh, so they're blocking out all the activity around them and focusing on the phone, much like these people with their iPods are not hearing what's around them. They are isolating themselves through sound and earphones. And the piece, which might be hard to see altogether, oh yeah, they're in a crowd. So piece called Current Events. It's also called Global Isol Isolation because even as we're reaching out globally to each other, we tend to ignore what is right around us. Ignoring the crowd, ignoring the possible interactivity we could have with the people right near us, and instead uh, choosing
people who are potentially far away, um, which is an interesting, very interesting development in social interaction. I have a couple small pieces here that were inspired by photos I took of street art in um, Venice, Florence, and Rome. This is a beautiful one, I believe, of the model Stella Tennant as a skeleton, <laughs> which is pretty accurate. Um, and uh, she's my favorite supermodel. Um, and then the great brickwork and the crumbling texture of the wall, the walls in Venice. Venice really is crumbling uh, in a very beautiful, slow way. So this series here is just all street art. Uh, this is in Rome. This was in uh, the Quadraro section of Rome, right near the, the place where we were staying, our uh, cousin's Airbnb. They gave it to us for the week, which was really nice. And this is called Afro Diva. Just a beautiful, beautiful painting on a, on a door. Uh, when we were in Florence, we were right next to the, the uh, gay baths, um, and, and that was pretty, pretty fun. Um, and then this is another one from Venice, the ogre with a cocktail, which I think accurately describes how Venetians think of tourists, even though I think 80% of Venetians are actually tourists themselves. Uh, it's a really, it's a really crazy environment in Venice and can be because of the tourists. There's a, there's a lot of overcrowding. Um, so I can see why they like it when the tourists leave. <laughs> this piece here is called Demon Family Tree. Um, through research, I discovered that in the mid to late 18th century, they, I'm sorry, 17th century, um, someone paired demons with their vice. So I can't get close enough. Um, Leviathan. Let's see, Amun and Ira. So Amun would be, Ira is wrath. Um, so those two go together. Lucifer and Superbia. I believe the Superbia is the ego. Um, Beelzebub and Gulla, which is sloth. Or wait, is that sloth or is that... No, I'm trying to remember. Or that's gluttony. Beelzebub must be, I think, is gluttony. But this is a great piece. Um, the tree happened very organically. You can see how three-dimensional the piece is. Uh, the, it's in paraffin and caustic and fabric. The background is fabric. But that was a really fun piece to make. Um, it's going to be impossible to get all of these. This is another piece. This is entirely in caustic. This was inspired be, by um, the Alhambra in Granada, Spain, the, uh, the Islamic temple and fortress, and just the gorgeous uh, Mukarnas architecture and the tiling uh, based on the 12-pointed star. Uh, just incredibly inspirational, incredibly beautiful. The first time I saw, um, what is it, in the Hall of the Ambassadors, it's uh, Seven Levels of Heaven Ceiling. I first saw photos of it and literally started crying. So you can see this is a huge inspiration for me. Uh, geometric architecture, um, Islamic motifs are incredibly beautiful. And so they inspired this piece, Seven Levels of Heaven. There's another, the final migration piece, which is up top, but I don't think we're really going to be able to see that. It's called Arches, and it's a three-dimensional environment, once again, using the tiny little figures of overlapping fabric, only this time I used uh, old leather gloves and cut them apart, put them back together. Um, maybe we can get another view of it from here, but it's going to be really hard. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Going back over here to another plaster painting, um, much like current events and the uh, Dive Deep, the David Lynch piece. These are handmade stencils, uh, drawings that I made that I turned into stencils and then used to layer the plaster. Uh, it gives an incredibly smooth texture. It's very much used in like a Venetian plaster technique for the home, which I've also done. 
Um, and it just, this is called the myth perpetuating. Um, the myth, perpetuating the myth, perpetuating the myth. And uh, you get some great texture with the layering of the stencils and the wax. And this is another, I don't really tell people to touch it, but you can touch it because it's nice and smooth. Um, and this piece is, goes into the incredibly deep relationship that we have with ourselves. Um, how we see ourselves, how we would like to see ourselves, how we think other people see us, and basically dealing with our reflection, uh, both physically and psychologically, and uh, the different relationships that we have with ourself and how that affects our relationships with others. And this is, this is an older piece. This is a more recent piece. This is called Exotic Birds of Prey, 96 hour flight, because it took me 96 hours to complete it. Um, and I completed it over, I think about five days. So I was not sleeping very much. Um, incredibly detailed piece, if I can get in here. Each of these, um, each of these tags is fabric saturated in encaustic in different colors. Uh, the encaustic is different colors, the fabric is all white. And then each of these pieces is individually fused onto the panel with heat. Um, this is another tactile piece that's fun to pet. Um, this was a very freeform piece. I really, uh, the only rules that I had were I set myself a color palette and a goal to work within the natural grain of the wood. So the shapes that you see here are actually uh, coloring inside the line, coloring inside the lines of the grain of the wood on the panel. Um, you can still see the wood edge here. But uh, this was, yeah, this is an incredibly intense piece to make. Um, I had to finish it in time for my show at the Lyman Allen Art Museum, and I'm really happy with the way it came out. And it was nice to have the rules, the guidelines to follow. It became very meditative, just attaching the pieces. Um, I didn't have to make too many decisions about where they went since the lines dictated that, and I already had my color palette, so it was a nice exercise. Okay. <laughs> and I think this is the last piece on the second floor. This is my totem the owl. And I normally don't do cutesy stuff like this, but he's just so cute. And um, I was playing around with some different techniques. I had gotten a, a rocker panel that makes wood texture for faux finishes, and I do some faux finishes, so I thought I would play around with that wood graining rocker tool um, with plaster and paint. So the majority of this painting is plaster, uh, tinted plaster, except for the, uh, the wood graining, which is latex paint. But uh, owls have always been there for me. They seem to be lost. I'll see a poster of an owl, or I will see a real owl, and all of a sudden I will know exactly where to go. Uh, it's just this weird phenomenon, so I have this attachment to owls. And I saw a picture of this owl, and I just thought, wow, he's so cute. I have to do that. You'll probably never see another cutesy thing like that from me, but that's all right. Maybe you will. Maybe I'll do another cutesy piece. But yeah, animals, landscapes, portraiture, something I normally do not do a lot of. And I think that's it for this room. So we're going to head upstairs to the final floor of the exhibit. Hope you don't get dizzy again.